Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be giving this talk for the uh, Japanese Department of Foreign Affairs. Uh, and it's, this talk is in part a response to their request and invitation to talk about the latest IPCC report, the special report on oceans and cryosphere in a changing climate. This report is a uh, collaboration between the World Meteorological, World Meteorological Organization and the United Nations Environment Program. And this special report in particular was commissioned by a number of countries uh, with their request to IPCC for a special report on the oceans and cryosphere and high mountains. I won't talk about the high mountains, I'll give primary focus to the oceans and cryosphere. My name is Nathan Bindoff. I was the coordinating lead author for chapter five of this special report on oceans and cryosphere. This talk will make focus mainly on the uh, summary for policymakers and the key messages that came out of that report from its release on the 25th of September, 2019. The special report is uh, quite unusual because it covers the physical system, the ecosystems, and also policy responses that you might make or one might make in a response to the changing climate. This report was uh, for formally launched on the 25th of September in Monaco, um, in Monaco. And most of this talk will reflect the uh, release of that report um, in the special press and media conference. The special report is in fact um, uh, the conclusion of two years of extraordinarily hard work by 104 different authors there were 36 different countries involved. 31% of the authors were women. And that report took into account, since the fifth assessment report, something like 7,000 uh, papers and reports. It was reviewed over uh, four different rounds. And as a response, we received something like 32,000 comments from experts uh, in the oceans and cryosphere and high mountains, and also from uh, countries uh, who had comment around these reports and its assessments. So on reflection, this report is in many ways a very credible assessment of our current understanding of the changes in the oceans and cryosphere. One of the major conclusions that you could uh, sum up is that the world's oceans and cryosphere have been taking the heat from climate change for decades. And taking the heat is actually a very nice pun on the fact that the oceans have a incredibly central role in the Earth's energy balance. The oceans in the fifth assessment report and in this report are estimated to be taking more than 90% of the total radiation balance, warming the oceans and delaying the surface, the rise in surface temperature, both over land and in the oceans. The consequences, uh, as you'll kind of see, for both nature and humanity are quite sweeping and severe in this uh, particular part of the Earth system. I'll talk first about the polar regions. The polar regions, while not uh, part of the Pacific, have an incredibly important role in influencing the changes that will go, that will occur, and um, uh, and the responses and the people who are affected by changes in the polar regions. The polar regions central 
in many ways to the future of our coasts. The polar regions house, house uh, the polar regions are the home to Greenland, Antarctic ice sheets and the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets are both losing mass and this loss of mass leads to leads to increased amount of water in the oceans causing sea level to rise. Greenland and Antarctica have only in the last 30 years been understood to be losing mass and this mass loss by both Greenland and Antarctica is increasingly attributed to uh, human activities by changing the composition of the atmosphere. It's clear in the projections of future sea level that Greenland and Antarctic will continue to melt and that actually this melt is continuing the, is committing the planet to long-term global sea level rise. In the fifth assessment report, there were some examples that showed that the melt of Greenland uh, uh, the melt of Greenland was at a particular threshold uh, for higher temperatures, greater sea level for lower temperatures, very much lower sea level. And the threshold is somewhere between one and two degrees. The, it's clear that um, Arctic sea ice is declining every month of the year and it's uh, getting thinner. With a global temperature of one and a half degrees, it's clear that the Arctic Ocean will rarely be free of sea ice in September. With just an additional half of degree of warming, the Arctic Ocean actually will be uh, free of sea ice in one in three years during the September month. It's also clear that um, permafrost around the world is uh, thawing and there's actually very significant potential for adding greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. And these greenhouse gases that come from permafrost are a significant source of unaccounted um, greenhouse gases in our current uh, simulations. If we were able to limit uh, global warming to well below two degrees, only a one quarter of the near surface permafrost would thaw by 2100. If emissions uh, continue to increase and uh, increase strongly, then the expectation would be that 70% of the near surface permafrost could be lost. This would have significant impacts on the people living in the Arctic. Uh, uh, although it's quite clear that the Arctic indigenous people are already adapting to climate change. Now, the polar regions are a key contributor to sea level rise. But in fact, sea level rise is probably, is, is going to affect low-lying coastal areas uh, very significantly. One of the important homes of uh, important homes of people is in the small island developing states, mostly in the Pacific Ocean, which are home to 65 million people. There's also about 680 million people who live in the low-lying coastal zones in the world, many of them in the Pacific, spread throughout Asia and Indian Ocean regions. Sea level rise is a critical element to the thinking around, is a critical element to the thinking around the future of coasts. And, and, and it's quite small changes in the mean sea level that can have quite profound impacts around coastal extremes, and it's through coastal extremes that we experience the change of sea level. During the 12th, 20th century, global sea mean sea level rose by 17 centimetres uh, at a rate of roughly 1.7 millimetres per year. Current sea level is actually accelerating and it's running at twice as fast as it has in the 21st century. We roughly got a sea level rise of greater than three millimetres per year 
and that three millimetres per year will continue to accelerate so that the total sea level by 2100 will be about 1.1 metres. This estimate is uh, slower than that came from the fifth assessment report and reflects our increasing knowledge around the, cha the ca changed contributions to sea level from Antarctica and from Greenland. Extreme sea level events actually occur, occurring, which, which are relatively rare, are now occurring more frequently uh, during high tides and intense storms. And as a consequence, many of the low-lying coastal cities and small islands will be increasingly exposed to risks of flooding and land loss annually by 2050, especially uh, where there's no strong adaptation. And I'll just illustrate some of these changes that are being presented in terms of extreme sea level events uh, are, that are projected to occur once every year. Already in many areas where sea level doesn't change, uh, where the sea level has been relatively constant, for instance, in the small island in the Western Pacific here where my cursor is, you can already see that the extreme sea level events are already occurring annually. Now, if you look at the colors, you can see that uh, a yellow color would mean that an extreme sea level event occurred every every uh, every year by 2100. An example is in the northern part of Australia. And one of the things that's striking with this map of an analyzed variations for each of the tide gauge sites around in, across the world of uh, suitable duration is that there are very strong regional differences in the occurrence of high or extreme sea level events uh, every year. But the key point is that some areas have already experienced high sea level events occurring every year, particularly in the, uh, in the tropical regions of the world. And, and what is further interesting is that we have options. In the case of a low emission scenario, where we have 2.6 watts per meter squared by the end of the century, we can expect that many regions will actually uh, suffer high sea level um, events by, the, by 2060, 2080, for example, around Japan and around much of the coastlines in Australia. If you make the comparison to the high emission scenario, we're at 8.5 watts per meter squared at the end of the century, you can see there's a very significant intensification of the colors where they means that they're progressively becoming earlier in time where we have high sea level events recurring annually. And indeed, it's quite clear in this figure which shows the difference between a low emission scenario and a high emission scenario that in many cases the choice of a low emission scenario would actually lead to uh, climate change, high, high sea level events um, being greater than 10 years earlier with a high emission scenario and in over much of the uh, eastern Pacific it's already arrived and it's less than 10 years of difference. So there are various responses that we can make at the policy level in response to sea level rise and coastal extremes. And some of those options are actually explored in the special report on oceans and changing climate. There are a variety of adaptation approaches and they are in some sense obvious. There's protection of the coastline through increasing its height. There's actually accommodation where you let uh, localized inundation to occur. There's ecosystem-based adaptation responses. For example, the, uh, planting of, the planting of mangroves to increase the resilience of the coastal environment. The, the management of dunes and other sorts of soft environments. 
there's coastal advance where you literally actually build uh, move forwards into the ocean to protect the, uh, the, uh, the environment behind and there's actually finally and perhaps a, a drastic solution where there's managed relocation of assets and people and the important thing is that something uneven about the risks and exposures people often with the highest uh, exposure and vulnerability are those that have the lowest capacity to respond. So now let's talk about the, not just simply the coast and its height, but how the life in the oceans as well responds uh, as a response of the changing climate and human uh, activities. The oceans play an incredibly uh, important regulatory role in terms of the Earth's climate. The oceans have taken up more than 90% of the excess heat in the climate system, and the ocean will continue to take up heat whether we have a low emission scenario or a much higher emission scenario. For a low emission scenario, it will take up a further two to four times more heat than we've already actually taken up and a further five to seven times more heat with higher emissions. One of the things that is striking is that as you warm the surface of the planet, the waters below respond at a much slower rate. And as a consequence, there's a tendency for the ocean surface to become lighter and warmer than the deeper waters. And thus, there's a increase in the stratification of the oceans. And one of the consequences of the increased stratification of the oceans is the reduced ability for the oceans to, to take surface waters and mix it into the lower waters. And therefore, there's a reduction in oxygen to the deeper layers and a reduction in nutrients from the deeper layers to the surface layers, both of which have consequences for marine life. Because the ocean surface of the ocean is warming, marine heat waves, like on land, these uh, warm events, these extreme events, are becoming more frequent and increasingly severe. There are there is well documented evidence of these heat waves harming warm water corals and kelp forests and affecting the distribution of marine life. Marine heat waves are not only they twice as common, they're actually longer in duration. The ocean, um, in response to the increasing carbon emissions, increases increasingly takes up those carbon emissions and increases its own acidity. And this acidification of the surface ocean is more than 30 percent. It's more than a 30 percent change in the number of H plus hydrogen plus molecules. And it's actually between 20 to 30% of the total emissions from humankind. The fish in particular are very sensitive to the changing temperatures. And because they can swim, they actually move in response. So the warming of the oceans is shifting fish populations. And I'll illustrate this a little bit more in a moment. But it turns out, actually, that this uh, shift in the populations is actually leading to a global level, a global reduction in catch potential. And in some regions, there will be very strong decreases. And, and in some, and the, most particularly in the high latitudes, there will be increases uh, in productivity. Communities that actually depend on uh, seafood will have increased risks, both from a decline in the amount of food and also in their nutritional health, where they depend on fish for micronutrients. It's clear that uh, if we can reduce other pollution, other pressures pressures on uh, fish populations, such as pollution, we will help 
marine life deal with these changes in the natural environment. Policy frameworks uh, currently exist actually for fisheries management and marine protected areas, but building on those current frameworks to uh, help people to adapt and respond to climate change. Let me just illustrate the sort of cycle of change that we might expect in the oceans and, and also give a few clues to the sorts of geographic regions that will most be affected. The changing ocean conditions that you can see on the right here is really around the drivers of the, uh, of the system, the physical drivers, the changing temperatures, the changing level of oxygen in the water column, the changing level of, uh, of ocean acidification, the ocean pH, ocean acidity. And, and the way that these physical drivers manifest themselves is they alter, and this is a particular part of the special report, they alter the surface net primary productivity, which affects our carbon and, carbon and energy uh, for the underlying food web. That, that change in primary productivity affects the total animal biomass, particularly the organisms in the upper part of the food web, and that flows through to affecting maximum fisheries catch potential, where the term catch potential is really approximate, a proxy for the maxima, maximum sustainable yield uh, in the oceans. And it's through the drivers of temperature, uh, stratification and changing oxygen levels and acidification that we see and we can model these and we can see this as uh, as the net primary productivity the total animal biomass that we can estimate in the global oceans this figure is showing those uh, the total animal biomass and the maximum fish catch potentials and with those drivers you can explore what is the consequence of these changes in the drivers of the climate system on for various emission scenarios. A low emission scenario with 2.6 watts per meter squared by the end of the 21st century and a high emission scenario by of 8.5 watts per meter squared by the end of the 21st century. And if you look carefully, you can see each of these figures is stippled and the stippling here shows the level of uh, model disagreement. So where areas are stippled, we have less confidence about the agreement between the models. And you can see that in a low emission scenario where there's a relatively weak signal, the net primary productivity is only relatively in good agreement in the equatorial zone, the equatorial zones of the Pacific Indian Atlantic and oceans. You can see that actually we have even greater agreement uh, on the question of the total animal biomass. And you can see that in many regions, the positive numbers, uh, the reds, the oranges through to browns, reflect a declining animal biomass in the, once again, in the equatorial regions of the global oceans with more neutral colors around the gray, and then increases in productivity, particularly in the high northern latitudes and also in many parts of the Southern Ocean itself. And then we can actually calculate the maximum catch potential we would expect by the end of the 21st century for low emissions uh, the low emission scenario. And you can see, even with low emissions, declines of typically between 0 and 20% across the equatorial band of the Pacific, Indian and Atlantic Oceans, and also declines uh, in the coastal regions in the North Atlantic itself. The, if these uh, declines are significant, are significant in the context of a changing climate, the high emission scenario provides a much more intense or amplified perspective than the low emission scenario. And you can see that even 
with high emission scenario, more than 50% change in the animal, in the fish catch potential, in the fish up to 50% change in the fish catch potential through most of the equatorial zone with increased yields in the Arctic Ocean and high latitude uh, polar regions and with less certainty around high, the high latitude Southern Ocean itself. So one of the striking messages that comes from this assessment of uh, what the future of climate change has on both maximum catch potential and also on total animal biomass is a very sharp and strong uh, negative impacts, particularly through the equatorial band, equatorial band in the Pacific, Indian and Atlantic, in Atlantic Oceans with impacts also in the Northern Atlantic. We also, as part of understanding the marine ecosystems, looked at the coastal ecosystems. And um, one of the things that's striking is that we don't actually have numerical models with the capacity to actually simulate all of the coastal environments. And here we use a sophisticated, a relatively sophisticated system of risk assessment based on what are the key drivers of the marine ecosystem, coastal ecosystems. There's obviously the warming, there's the changes in uh, pH, there's eutrophication going on in the coastal regions, and so there's very often a decline in oxygen, driven in part by human activity and also by a um, increased stratification. There's a tendency for increased inundation of the coasts and other extreme events that occur in the coastal regions. And all of these can actually inter, inter, interact with each other to develop, a, uh, to develop negative or positive impacts for uh, coastal ecosystems. So we're interested in how all of these drivers uh, hazards, induced changes in, in the structure, the functioning and the biodiversity of these marine ecosystems and how they can uh, adapt naturally. And it led to this risk assessment for most of the key marine ecosystems around the world. So the, each of these bars, many have been published like this before in previous reports, covered ecosystems such as warm water corals, kelp forests, sea meadow, seagrass meadows, the epipelagic region uh, in the open ocean and also in, mostly in the open ocean, rocky shores, salt marshes, cold water corals, estuaries, sandy beaches, mangrove forests and deep sea benthos. And you can see in fact that these risks and the thresholds associated with the changing risks indicated here by the uh, small vertical bar to the right of the uh, burning ember with their respective confidence levels. And you can see that these different ecosystems have different uh, thresholds between their low, medium and high risk. Low, low to medium to high to very high risk. And you can see that the, uh, we have more information and more certainty around corals and we get weaker and weaker when we talk about the deep sea benthos. And in this analysis, with everything has been calibrated to global mean surface temperature relative to pre-industrial times. And broadly speaking, but not exactly, we've come about 0.8 degrees in the global mean sea surface temperature. We're um, looking at policy options since the Paris Agreement of 1.5 degrees and the Kyoto Agreement of 2 degrees. And then uh, with an unmitigated world, increased temperatures up to 4 degrees. And what we can see across all of these ecosystems is that none of them have actually have a beneficial change in the ecosystem 
as a response to uh, the warming across all of those systems. All of them have, even the deep sea benthos, evidence of change, and none of them have positive. The most affected ecosystems are the warm water corals, uh, particularly in the equatorial band, affects tourism for many of the small island developing states and, it, and for uh, countries like Australia. So let me now draw this uh, brief summary, very brief summary of the IPC special report on ocean and cryosphere in a changing climate together. It's very clear in the report that we're able to present uh, information around a variety of issues, key and important issues. The future of the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheet, the future of permafrost, the future of uh, coastal environments which affect more than between six and 700 million people around the world and in particular those in the small island developing states. We can see that fishing uh, and fishing catch potential is expected to decline. The declines are actually extraordinary in the equatorial band, changing of up to 50%, halving of the maximum catch potential yield. Our catch potential isn't a proxy, it's not exactly what the future may hold. This depends on the way those fisheries are actually managed with other human interventions. But it's very clear that high emission scenarios lead to very noticeable further erosion of the, or of the uh, natural environment. And what these things together highlights is actually the urgency of prioritising timely, ambitious and coordinated action. The high emission scenarios are always worse than the low emission scenarios. And the low emission scenarios in this report uh, could actually be increased in their ambition for even lower emissions. It's clear that one and a half degree, an ambition of one and a half degrees has net benefits for almost all of the ecosystems that were assessed as part of the report. It's clear that we need coordinated action to address widespread and enduring changes in the oceans and cryosphere. It's in the policy part, it's very clear in the research that's been done that empowering people and communities and governments to tackle unprecedented transitions in all the aspects of society. And what has struck me is how pervasive those changes are already being identified in society. There's um, enormous benefit in providing evidence of the benefits of uh, scientific and local and indigenous knowledge. And curiously, the policy response is that we really do need to connect and in this report for a first time, the importance of education and climate literacy. So in the Monaco uh, release of the summary for policymakers, this statement was here, we more decisively and earlier we act the more we'll be able to address the unavoidable changes and manage the risks, improve lives and achieve sustainability for ecosystems and people around the world today and in the future. And an overarching message is that the oceans and cryosphere are critical elements of the climate system. The failure of the ice sheets, really even by 2100, threatens nearly a billion people. The high mountain areas, actually, there's nearly a billion that live there. The oceans and cryosphere feed us and the catch potential is expected to decline very significantly. The oceans are under pressure and yet we use them
for many things. Thank you very much. And there's much more information at these websites and Twitter feeds. Good morning to everybody. Uh, before I start, I would like to thank the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Japan, specifically Ms. Erika Hayami, for the invitation in this conference on climate change in the Pacific Ocean to be held in Yokohama, Japan. Yours truly is Dr. Landrico Dalida Jr., the Deputy Administrator for Operation and Services in the Philippines and in cooperation with Telma A. Cinco, the Assistant Weather Services Chief, Climatology and Agreement Division, both of the DOST, Pagasa. And this is our presentation. The Observed Climate Trends and Projected Climate Change in the Philippines. The outline of my uh, presentation, one is the Observed Trends in the Philippines and the Climate uh, Projection the SRES and RCP based in climate change uh, projection. Philippines is divided into four types of uh, climate. We have the type 1, type 2, type 3, and type 4. Type 1 is the uh, area in the western part of the Philippines which has two pronounced seasons that dry from November to April and wet during the rest of the year. Uh, the type 2, which is on the eastern side of the Philippines, has no dry season with a very pronounced uh, maximum rain period from December to February. And type 3 and type 4 is on the inland part of the Philippines. There are several factors that cause climate variability in the Philippines. One is the southwest monsoon from June to July and August, and then the northeast monsoon, on the months of October, November, and December. We have all, also uh, tropical cyclones, which has the 19 to 20 average tropical cyclone in a year, the highest in the world. And the Philippines is the third in the world as the country's most exposed and at risk to natural hazard from the report of 2016 of the world risk after Vanuatu and Tonga. And aside from that, we have the intertropical convergence zone. What are the observed climate trends in the Philippines? In the Philippines, from the data from Bagasa, the temperature is observed as rising. And that uh, from 1951 to 2015, or for the past 65 years, we have an increase of 6.68 degrees centigrade. And for the annual maximum temperature increase, we have an 0.24 degrees centigrade. And for the annual minimum temperature increase, we have 0.99 degrees centigrade. Here shows the Philippine projection or the mean temperature uh, from 1971 to 2000, which is uh, from the RCP 8.5 and RCP. 4.5 uh, model, which is uh, red and blue consecutively. And for the black one, these are the observed uh, temperature in the Philippines. And for the result of the RCP 4.5 and RCP 8.5, there is an increase in annual mean temperature uh, which shows a large amount of warming by the end of the century with all the models agreeing on warming for both uh, this model. And these are the summary of changes uh, from the RCP 4.5 and RCP 8.5 from the mid 21st century to the end of the 21st century. And that uh, the amount is uh, for RCP 4.5, the 
increase is from 0.9 to 1.9 from the mid 20th century and for the RCP 8.5 the mid 20th century shows the 1.2 to 2.3 degrees centigrade increase and for the end of the 20th century for the RCP 4.5 we have an increase of 1.3 to 2.5 degrees centigrade and for the RCP 8.5 there is an increase of 2.5 to 4.1 degrees centigrade at the end of the 21st century. In the Philippines also on, the, on this uh, next slide there is, there is an observed number of hot days and warm nights as shown in this uh, slide. And also as observed in the eastern Leyte and Samar, in the east uh, of Mindanao, south of Zamboanga, and along the southwestern coast of Central Visayas, Central and Western Visayas, there is a sea level increase or rising in the Philippines. And uh, from the study of the the FID project, UK Met Office uh, report, there is an increase of 4.5 to 5 millimeter per year from 1993 to 2015, as shown by this slide. Also, uh, rainfall in the Philippines is changing. For the blue uh, arrow, Parts of central and northern Luzon, part of eastern Visayas, and northeastern and southwestern section of Mindanao, there is an increase of rainfall. But for the uh, blue, uh, for the brown uh, arrow, there is a, a, an observed uh, rainfall decrease in under section of Luzon, part of western Visayas, and the central and western section of Mindanao. From, uh, for the next slide, from 1951 to 2010, there is an observed trend on climate extremes in the Philippines and that there is an increase of frequency and intensity of extreme rainfall as shown in this uh, slide from 1951 to 2010. And what are the potential impacts of climate change in the Philippines? The increase of extreme rainfall means there is a risk to floodings and landslide, as shown in this uh, next slide. That uh, landslide, uh, it, this was in Saint Bernard landslide in February 2006, showing that uh, in the part of Ginsaugun, Central Philippines, there is a, an uh, increase. Uh, there is a landslide which kills thousands of people downstream of this uh, area. Also, due to tropical cyclone uh, Sendong on December 15 to 17, 2011, there are many parts in the Philippines which submerged in planning. In Manila, in Metro Manila, which is the heart of the Philippines, there is what we call the risk to urban flooding and transport disruption. And this uh, picture shows what happened in the central, uh, in central Metro Manila during the occurrence of tropical cyclone Undoy. Also, in the next slide, high temperature and prolonged dry season means deficit in rainwater. And uh, this will also affect our agriculture industries. And many parts of the Philippines, especially on urban areas, there will be shortages in rainwater. From uh, 1948 to 2016, uh, there is an observation that there are some uh, changes in tropical cyclone, meaning the annual frequency of tropical cyclone in the Philippines, uh, Philippine area of responsibility, responsibility from 1948 to 2016 is shown in this uh, slide. And what does it mean? Meaning that for the projected future, in the next slide, uh, projected future change in the tropical cyclone is to affect the Philippines. And for the climate model simulation from 1, 2, and uh, 5, for the change in tropical cyclone frequency, there's a decrease 
in the simulation of the climate model in number one, two, and five, and wherein the change in tropical cyclone intensity in model two and four shows or indicate an increase in tropical cyclone intensity. And this source was uh, from the Doron et al. 2016 of the FID Project UK Met Office report. And from Pagas observation also, from uh, 1980 to 2015, there is a, uh, this shows that uh, the graph shows a very strong tropical cyclone occurrences in the Philippines, meaning uh, strong tropical cyclones are increasing for the last uh, uh, years of 1980 to 2015. And uh, the next slide shows the effect of this uh, strong or very strong typhoons that hit uh, Philippines. Uh, on the left side shows the uh, damages from Typhoon Milenio from September 25 to 20, 29 in 2006, which has uh, a record of 100 maximum uh, in wind of 150 kilometers per hour and a gustiness of 160 kilometers per hour. And there were some many casualties in the area. What the Philippines do to make the country resilient to climate uh, variability and change? The Philippines, through its uh, National Disaster Coordinating Council, or the NDCC, strengthened its action plan through the various phases of disaster management in support to disaster risk management and climate change adaptation. And we have four uh, action plans. One is the mitigation or prevention. Number two is preparedness. Three is response. And number four is the recovery. On the next slide shows the uh, Malabon flood hazard and facilities map. This is uh, one of the uh, city in Metro Manila wherein the flood hazard was uh, done to make sure that uh, this uh, map will show the emergency services infrastructure, meaning the school, hospital, clinic, shelter, fire station, police station, uh, whenever there is a uh, possibility of flooding. So it shows the evacuation area and the lifelines. On the next slide, uh, it shows that before the occurrence of a hazard, let's say the tropical cyclone, the community in the area are preparing for an evacuation drill so that uh, whenever there is a tropical cyclone uh, landfall in their area, it is automatic that uh, they should evacuate and go to their respective uh, evacuation centers. Another uh, means of informing the people is the public education and awareness program. There are many pamphlets regarding the effect of the floods, which is uh, the effect of uh, severe storms, into uh, given into a documental documentation or manuals. And these are all uh, given from the national down to the regional, municipal, provincial, and down to the barangay level. And of course, to the different uh, stakeholders in the Philippines, especially on schools. So there is a uh, frequent uh, information education campaign to the different uh, areas in the Philippines, whole, whole nation, with regards to the floods, the tropical cyclone, and other weather uh, hazard that uh, affect the, the Philippines. And for my last slide, uh, this shows the different uh, uh, website that uh, wherein our information, warnings are given. We have the as a website, we have the Facebook, we have the Twitter, and we can be contacted on these different uh, telephone numbers. With that, thank you very much and good day.
My name is Nobuhito Mori uh, from Disaster Prevention Research Institute of Kyoto University. I'm going to talk, explain about climate change and coastal hazard in the Pacific. So this is a slide from the IPCC SROC in Chapter 4. So climate change uh, gives an impact on the cost of flooding, which include uh, sea level rise, storm surge, and the wave setup. So these are important phenomena for the coastal uh, hazard protection. However, it is not well known uh, how uh, coastal hazard intensity is going to be increased depending on the region, country, and uh, ocean basin. Especially uh, regarding coastal hazard uh, or coastal uh, protection, uh, uh, sea level rise is one of key points. Uh, however, uh, uh, however, uh, waves, swells, and the storm surges are important to know. And then, uh, storm surge is. Uh, gives high impact on the coastal hazard, but the scale is pretty small compared to the climate uh, change. So it is a little bit difficult to understand uh, this characteristic in the future climate. Of course, sea level rise is most important and uh, it changes gradually and uh, it's smooth in space too. And expected sea level rise uh, can be a half meter to the one meter. Uh, depend on the scenario. And the uh, tropical cyclone or low pressure system gives a, a future change of the storm surge and the waves, and uh, it can be occurred in very short in time and the local uh, uh, regions. And the expected uh, change of the, not expected change, just change, uh, expected intensity of waves and uh, storm surges can be. Uh, ranged from 1 meter to 10 meter. So it is important to combine these two or three uh, components uh, under the climate change situation. So this is a, a, a typical uh, projection of the sea level rise. It's slightly uh, uh, non uniform uh, in space, but overall. Uh, it can be increased up to uh, 80 to 1 meter uh, in the Pacific Ocean region. Then waves projection is uh, difficult to uh, conduct until IPCC L5. And this is our recent paper from Nature Climate Change. And then uh, mean average wave height is going to be uh, increased in the middle of the Pacific, but will be decreased in the Northern Pacific region. So this is a uh, average wave height, but extreme uh, can be a, a different from here. So uh, a tropical cyclone uh, and the related storm surge uh, gave uh, give uh, catastrophic damage. So it already occurred in several uh, islands in the Pacific, for example. Uh, Typhoon High in 2013 gave a catastrophic damage in the in the Philippines, and the Cyclone Pam uh, gave a, a high intensity damage in the Vanuatu in 19, uh, 2015. And uh, in Japan, we had a severe storm surge uh, last year, which uh, gave a large inundation at the Kansai Airport. So uh, it is important to know how uh, tropical cyclone intensity is going to be increased or decreased in the future climate. So uh, this is a repo figure from IPCC R5. So it is expected uh, intense tropical cyclone, which ranged from cat category three to four, is uh, expected going to increase in the future climates. Also, uh, small a minor typhoon is going to be decreased to be uh, in the future climate. So this is our uh, latest uh, future projection of the future change of uh, storm surges uh, in the world. The colored coastal line indicate how 
much uh, storm surge intensity in a one by 100 years level is going to be changed. So uh, blue color indicate green color indicate almost neutral. Uh, so uh, and the blue color indicate uh, negative, decreasing future trend. So plus two degree, uh, we don't see much severe storm surge uh, change except some East Asia. However, uh, plus four degree uh, light below panel indicate it can be increased in the middle of the Pacific, uh, more than uh, 20 to 30 percent. So uh, combining these uh, projection or impact assessment of the coastal hazard, now we started to consider the how uh, we can adapt uh, our coastal protection uh, under the climate change. So this is the schematic view of the, our proposing uh, adaptation strategy for natural hazard. And blue color indicate, indicate, indicate intensity of the hazard and uh, uh, red smooth line indicate trend of the global warming. And the green line indicate uh, a capacity range of the, of the hazard. So if blue line over uh, green line, uh, it can be a, a disaster. So even now we have, we can see the disaster depends on region over time. However, if uh, we will follow the future change torrent, which indicate that line uh, following current projection, uh, intensity, both intensity and the mean of the hazard is going to be increased gradually. Uh, with this kind of trend, we need to adapt or increase of the capacity range as shown in this figure. And the one important thing is uh, uh, adaptation takes uh, uh, time range from a year to a decade. So uh, it is sometimes not uh, adapt quickly uh, following the change of the uh, uh, disaster intensity. So it is important to know uh, what kind of adaptation strategy we will have and what, when uh, severe uh, hazard is going to be appeared in time and it is also important to uh, start adaptation uh, before starting to uh, hazard getting severe. So adaptation uh, strategy has have several uh, way in the Pacific and uh, in Japan we have large contribution to the green infrastructure in especially mangrove uh, for coastal hazards protection. So uh, this is a kind of uh, one of strategy to adapt uh, coastal hazards uh, under the climate change. So this is the end of my talk. Thank you very much. The title of my talk is another carbon dioxide problem. That means ocean acidification. I am Nami Harada, Japan Agency for Marine Earth Science and Technology. When atmospheric carbon dioxide dissolves in the surface seawater, carbon dioxide reacts immediately with H2O and change in bicarbonate and the hydrogen ions. As a result, the hydrogen ion increase in the seawater and seawater acidifies. This figure shows the prediction of lagonite saturation degree in 2100. If ocean acidification progress, the saturation degree of calcium carbonate become under saturation state. Red color means under saturation area for lagonite. As you can see, 
The significant ocean acidification will expand, especially in higher latitude in the Pacific, including Japanese coastal area. We compare the annual reduction rate of pH in pelagic ocean in the world. The light panel shows the time series uh, locations and annual reduction rate of pH at every site published by WMO Greenhouse Gas Britain 2014. The reduction rate of pH at the monitoring site in the Western Pacific Ocean, Station Knot and K2, is largest in the world. If we look at the coastal area, the values is larger than the empiragic waters, minus 0 0.003 plus minus 0 0.0009 per year. Uh, this value is coming from the northern part of Japanese main island. Next, let's see the relationship between atmospheric carbon dioxide and pH. The atmospheric carbon dioxide is 400 ppm at present. This value becomes 900 ppm in 2100 if we don't take any action. The pH reduction range will be 0.3 even if the atmospheric carbon dioxide will be 900 ppm. It looks small and no problem because the pH reduction is still ranging from alkaline to neutral. However, changing itself will give a big impact on marine organisms. What kind of organisms will be affected by ocean acidification? Species having hard parts, especially calcium carbonate tests are. Terapod is one of the symbolic organisms of ocean acidification. I had an opportunity to give a lecture for ocean acidification at primary school in last month. Children screamed when I I explained Creone, sea angel. Creone, sea angel cannot survive under serious ocean acidification condition because teropod is only Creone's food. Let's see the coastal species. Onitsuka et al. investigated ocean acidification effect on Ezo Avalon larvae by rearing ex experiment under control of CO2 concentration. The left graphs are the mortality, malformation, and larval shell length of Ezo Avalon larvae. Mortality was slightly high from 802. 1,600 ppm. Malformation rates were significantly high in the tank of 1,200 microatom and 800 to 1,600 microatom with diurnal variation. For shell length, significantly small size individuals were observed in the tank of 800 to 1600 microatom with diurnal variation. This study found that there was a PCO2 threshold 1100 ppm associated with omega aragonite for Ezo Avalon larvae. Well, now we, can, now we can answer the question when the Ezo Avalon 
starts to reach their ocean acidification threshold. As Avalon phase two threshold, when the diurnal maximum PCO2 reaches the aragonite saturation value, we must know the pattern of diurnal variation for carbon dioxide and pH in detail besides its daily average value. Such information cannot be acquired by hydrographic observation. We need continuous sensor monitoring for carbon dioxide and pH. Finally, we would like to consider about sushi. This is a standard menu served at the sushi bar in Sapporo, Hokkaido. The salmon egg, sea urchin, eel, soft plum, abalone, shrimp, scallop, club, and tuna. So which sushi fish will be forced by stressor? Sea urchin, surf plum, abalone, shrimp, scallop, crab are potentially affected by ocean acidification. Clearly, we have to consider about other stressors. Salmon egg will be stressed by warming, and air and tuna will be stressed by overfishing. We might not be able to eat same sushi fish after a decade and centennial years later at sushi bar in Sapporo due to multi stressors. Finally, I'd like to emphasize that the sushi's case in this presentation will not happen with an air time scale, but could happen with decade centennial time scale depending on our action. In Tokyo Bay, anthropogenic eutrophication causes diurnal PCO2 increasing plus 200 ppm and large diurnal variation larger than 800 ppm. Even if positive saturation state large diurnal carbon dioxide increasing and diurnal variation would give a negative impact on growth of larval shellfish. Shellfish aquaculture is an important ecosystem service for Japan, Korea, and China. We have to tackle with multi stressors, not only ocean acidification, but also heat wave and overfishing for a sustainable future. That's it. Thank you very much. First of all, I appreciate the symposium organizers to invite me to the important event. Unfortunately, the symposium was not held due to the typhoon. However, I am very happy to share the information with others through the internet. Thank you again for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Japan. Today, I will talk on climate change and fish production in the Pacific. First, I will explain about global fish production and then touch with climate impacts on fish production, show risk drivers, and discuss about a way to sustainable future. Here is the introduction. As you know, the global ocean covers 70% of surface of the earth and there are a variety of ecosystem services. 
one of the most important ecosystem services of the ocean is provision of food. In this figure, the orange line shows world population growth and the red line shows apparent consumption of fish and seafood by one person a year based on Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Global fish production has grown steadily in the last five decades with food fish supply increasing at an average annual rate of 3.2%, outpacing world population growth at 1.6%. Therefore, the ocean food supply is increasing its importance more and more recently. However, Marine living resources respond to climate and fluctuate. Here is an example for small pelagic species catch in Japan. In Pacific, sea surface temperature shows distinctive decadal fluctuation, are named as Pacific Decadal Oscillation (PDO). During negative PDO phase, which corresponds to warmer regime in Japan, anchovy and jack mackerel increase. On the contrary, during positive PDO phase, which corresponds to cooler regime in Japan, sardine comes up. Between the two regimes, jack mackerel increase. Small pelagic fishes show species alternation with 50 years time scale in the western North Pacific responding to climate variability. In addition to climate variability, now we are facing to global climate change. The sea water temperature has been warmed up with global climate change. Responding to the warming, shifts of many marine biota to the high latitude or deeper layer have been detected. Based on Polk Zanska et al. 2017 paper, more than 80% marine biota is shifting habitats to cooler regions responding global change. The driver's influence on marine ecosystem is not only temperature. Warming up the surface layer enhances ocean stratification, then nutrient supply from the deeper layer is reduced, and oxygen supply to the deeper layer is decreased. Less nutrient supply results in less prey plankton production, and deoxygenation decreases habitat areas of marine species. Ocean is absorbing carbon dioxide, and ocean acidification forces more energy into the growth of marine life. Based on potential future change of ocean condition, future potential fishery catch was projected. The projection showed distinct decrease of potential fish catches in the tropical areas with high confidence. Projected decreases in potential fish catches in tropical areas and the possible decrease in the nutritional content of seafood will further increase the risk of impacts of food security in low-latitude developing regions. The risk is greater under high-emission scenarios. 
However, our knowledge on marine ecosystem is still limited. Here is an example of potential response of Pacific sauri, one of the most important small pelagic species in the North Pacific. Under the current condition, Pacific sauri are making ontogenetic migration from subtropical to subarctic twice within their lifespan two years. However, under global warming situation, fish size is reduced mainly by prey zooplankton decrease. In addition, water temperature is enough warm in the mixed water region for sauri. These factors prevent southward migration of sauri in first winter and delay second year migration. Even if prey zooplankton decreases under global warming, the zooplankton abundance in the mixed water region is higher than subtropical region. As a result, prey condition is improved and sorry egg production is enhanced under future conditions. As shown in here, the response of marine ecosystem may be more complex. Here is an example for cham salmon. Based on the current optimal temperature, it was projected that cham salmon cannot migrate back to Japan in the end of 21st century. However, about 6,000 years ago, salmon migrated back to Japanese region, while the sea surface water temperature is 5 degrees C higher than the current. Recent biologic observations show that chub salmon can migrate deeper than 200 meter depths. It may be possible for chub salmon to avoid the warmer temperature by migrating in the deeper layer. Still, our knowledge is limited. Facing to this knowledge gap and global climate change, what can we do? The most important thing is to decrease CO2 emission. Each individual must think about lifestyles of health and sustainability. Regarding our ocean, it is important to increase ocean health. Comparing stressed ocean, unstressed ocean ecosystems should be resilient. It is important to reduce stress to the ocean and increase resilience to climate change. For example, reducing plastic waste is one of the possible ways for individual can contribute to increase the resilience of the ocean. In parallel, it is important to monitor the ocean to detect early signals, and it is urgent task for scientists to elucidate ocean processes responding to climate change. UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development will start from 2021, and it is good chance to improve our understanding of the ocean. Thank you very much for your attention. We would like to um, start by reviewing um, your presentations. Um, basically, well, you have um, um, uploaded your presentation um, already, and we really enjoyed well, having uh, your talk um, on, on WebEx. But uh, for the benefit of um, the, the further discussion, I, we would like to um, start by reviewing um, your presentations. Uh, Professor Dr. Bindov um, uh, provided well, the keynote presentation um, 
regarding uh, uh, IPCC special report on um, ocean and then uh, cryosphere in changing climate uh, or um, SLOC. And then in that special report, well, you have um, you actually were well, explained for well, the uh, the most updated for well, scientific evidence um, uh, regarding for well, changing climate and the impacts. And then this is uh, this actually uh, uh, is a uh, far improvement from compared from the uh, with the um, uh, AR five of, of IPCC. And then that's that's a, a great remarkable achievement for um, of the scientific community, I believe. And then well, you also explained for the um, uh, the mechanism of the um, how the climate change will impact well, um, in uh, ocean and then. Uh, the uh, the polar region um, is actually uh, polar polar regions um, have been actually well, the uh, the areas where where uh, the impact is uh, really big and then then well that uh, turns to the uh, also the impact to the um, ocean environment and then also um, on the top of it well uh, the um, that that uh, change also um, um, affects for the uh, human uh, living environment. And then uh, also you touch upon the importance of the education and then climate literacy. Um, I was personally uh, very much touched uh, on that um, aspect. So that the um, I would appreciate what well if uh, 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 Dr. Uh, Professor Dr. Bindov, perhaps well um, you might uh, uh, you can you can elaborate a little bit um, more on what kind of like climate. Um, education and climate literacy would you would you suggest for for us to go for? Thank you, thank you. Um, it, it's very interesting that you pick up on that last point, the point around education and climate literacy. Um, th this report is un unusual because it goes from the f physics, the chemistry the impacts on fisheries and ecosystems, coastal ecosystems, and then it goes to governance. And the issue for governance is there are many options in responding to the amount of climate change that we've already observed. And there are many options to thinking about how that uh, will evolve into the future. And one of the struggles in um, having successful adaptive responses is this question around climate literacy and climate education. Our chapter, and in fact the report, doesn't go to the question of what the best education would be or what literacy pro climate literacy programs uh, need to be established, but it, what it does do is recognise the importance of that in making successful adaptations on at the scale of human communities. And so that was a element that was drawn out from our chapter, but actually also across the six chapters uh, in that special report. So, so I like the fact that you actually pick up on that. Um, it's very clear we have to adapt in response to climate change. And because adaptation occurs on human scales, human communities, uh, national scales and international scales, it actually demands that kind of education and climate literacy so that we actually have successful adaptation responses. Is there a, I can talk too much, so let's just, uh, maybe I should just rein myself in is there anything else you would like me to talk to um, uh, at this moment? That, that's fantastic uh, to start to kick off um, our panel discussion. Um, I believe well, it's been a very uh, intensive process for to prepare for uh, this uh, special report. And then um, the um, science evidence actually um, is actually key for us to um, move forward uh, the uh, climate actions. And then I think um, uh, still, well, um, uh, we understand, well, um, we, we have more um, uh, you know, challenges to go for, but I think it, that, that, that your description is quite um, uh, 
Uh, I really like the the way well, you you describe the you know the current challenge and then maybe you said frustration, but I, I think that's that's some that indicates well um, maybe well our homework uh, uh, that we should um, um, work on continue to work on. Yeah. So so perhaps just to uh, finish off with one additional point, um, what we've done is really assess a literature across uh, all spheres of the oceans. So that seven thousand different citations. So it's it's so what is uh, very comprehensive, and there are very clear cut advantages in terms of environment and sustainability in a lower emissions versus high emissions, and it's it's very clear that actually there are distinct benefits between the lower emission pathways for the for almost all ecosystems uh, on in the coast and actually uh, certainly in the surface oceans and to some extent in the deep oceans. It's very clear that lower emissions uh, has a very significant impact on the on reducing the uh, negative effects of on fisheries and fisheries management. So, so the best science points to the fact that there are significant advantages in our lower emissions pathways. And so that one of the things that surprised me uh, in, this mess in this report is actually um, a little bit about the need for urgent action if we want to, if we decide that things are very important, right? That's a societal decision, but urgent action is really required to actually deliver against those lower emission pathways for which we can see clear benefits. All right, thank you very much. Okay, now let's turn to um, Professor Mori. Um, also, we enjoyed your um, presentation with uh, very beautiful graphics. And uh, well, we understand for the, from your uh, presentation, well, the climate change um, impacts actually uh, the uh, the um, sea level rise uh, increases for the uh, the risks of uh, natural disasters, and then um, that includes for the well high tide and then um, um, the uh, the low low pressure and the change of waves, and then also you introduce the uh, the uh, the current situation of like adaptation. And then well, also uh, you you pose the challenges of uh, 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 prediction uh, of um, typhoon uh, coming from the uh, uh, climate change. Well, um, probably well this time we we're, it's still challenging for well, um, uh, to say well what, how many uh, what, what what kind of typhoon is um, directly or indirectly well um, uh, uh, attributed to um, climate change. But I think, and um, uh, well, you also mentioned the the uh, decrease of the number of um, typhoon events, but the intense, uh, but the uh, the the there is a tendency of the uh, in, uh, highly well uh, very intensive uh, high intense um, typhoon, so that the those kind of uh, 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 trends and phenomena were um, introduced for well, um, in your uh, presentations. And then um, perhaps well, um, I should ask uh, uh, to you, Mori Sensei, uh, about a little bit more uh, uh, for, for our uh, understanding of the mechanism of um, climate change impacts. Uh, for example, um, if we look at the um, high tide or well, um, the rate of um, um, occurrence of high tide for well, um, after half 100 uh, years, uh, well, I can see well uh, slightly above the equator uh, in northern uh, side of northern latitude, perhaps for well, um, north latitude um, 50 to 30 degree. Well, it looks like uh, it's increasing. Um, is that uh, is that the case? Well, um, is that uh, right to understand? Well, that is uh, the um, the hot spots or well the area where we are going to see. Um, more uh, occurrence of uh, high tide or, or other uh, natural disaster events a hundred years later. So this is this is one humble question uh, from us. 
Okay, me, you may look in my some of the slides, and uh, one of my slides uh, present extreme storm surge projection. That is not 100 years later. That is an event can be occurred once per every 100 years. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Then, uh, so one of my uh, I, one, one I wanted to emphasize. If we have a conference <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, uh, why is adaptation is very difficult to depend on the time scale. So, for example, uh, Professor Bindoff uh, has a one figure how uh, we can adapt uh, under the severe climate change in the island. For one of option is a, for example, nat natural ecosystem like uh, using mangrove or coral reef. But it, for, uh, for example, mangrove uh, 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 leaf forestation take uh, uh, 10 to 20 years to get enough function to reduce uh, coastal disasters. So, uh, start of the timing to adaptation is related to the uh, how uh, climate change is going to be severe. So, we need to start adaptation uh, five to maybe 30 years in advance, depend on the adaptation strategy. So that is important to discuss near future. And additionally, uh, I want to uh, emphasize that uh, uh, in our field, coastal hazard, uh, number of study in the Pacific Island is very, very limited. So we, uh, although there are so many research uh, ongoing in the Northern, uh, Northern America, Europe, and the East Asia, but number of research related to the Pacific Island are very limited, so we have to uh, uh, accelerate the uh, research targeting on the southern island. Thank you very much for that. That's, that's very uh, important uh, for, for, for us for, um, in uh, Japan is a Pacific country. Right. Japan is a Pacific Island country, so that for us, well, it is also critical to uh, to see uh, uh, more advanced studies, um, science studies, well, um, in this area. So um, I'm sure you're one of uh, you're the one who is uh, taking well, one of the leads in this area. So I hope well your um, study will be also um, further. Uh, uh, you're you're taking the community of um, science community in this um, field. Thank you very much for your um, very good explanation. Thank you. Now I would like to turn to um, Dr. Harada uh, uh, for for your presentation. Um, well, you kindly introduced uh, the mechanism of um, ocean acidification, uh, and then uh, the um, the degree of the progress will, um, and then also prediction of how how much will it will uh, uh, will be um, progress, and then what are impacts of um, uh, this uh, phenomena on um, ocean uh, um, what, what what was very interesting is like uh, uh, you took the example of sushi and then well not only about the you know global uh, scale uh, uh, impact but also uh, the uh, the influence of um, um, other influence of um, um, uh, global warming and also the uh, uh, too much uh, ex excessive fishery. So those those were um, actually the package of uh, your uh, presentation. So that that was um, actually um, uh, very impressive. And then um, so that the in in that case, um, uh, well, um, my question is like. Um, could could you could you um, summarize? Well, what are uh, actually what the general trends of uh, different regions? Well, uh, in this um, ocean acidification, uh, are there any uh, difference for in the region? For example, like a Pacific Island or North and South, or um, uh, perhaps well, and then what what are uh, the you know difference for in the depth of ocean? Uh, could you could you um, tell us well what are um, uh, the current and future phenomena. Okay, um, thank you very much for asking me that uh, uh, pH about the pH. So, um, the annual reduction rate is um, very um, different 
depending on the place. So especially the polar regions, and especially Arctic Ocean and Antarctic Oceans, the sea surface temperature is very, very low. That's why the carbon dioxide can consume into the sea surface. So the polar area is um, going on the quite serious um, acidifying. Uh, that was the most um, serious area for um, ocean acidification in the world. So, and uh, the open waters, uh, um, there are a lot on time series and observation locations. The, if we see the Western Pacific Oceans, the pH is, the annual reduction rate of pH is the worst one, minus 0.0024. That number is the worst um, annual reduction rate in the world in the case of the open ocean. But if we see the coastal oceans, so the coastal ocean, the annual reduction rate of pH of the coastal area is um, higher um, as compared with that in the open oceans. So the my, yeah, this slide is showing the annual reduction rate of the pH, the most northern part of the Japan islands, main island, minus 0 0.003. This number is quite large as compared with the, the open ocean and annual reduction rate of pH. So maybe the coastal um, area is um, more serious um, acidifying the um, oceans um, as compared with that an open area. So and if we see the more um, tropical area, the Maybe annual reduction rate of pH is not so high, but I think that changing itself is um, very important, quite serious for the um, organisms, the living organisms. So the reduction rate, even if the number of reduction rate is small, but changing itself given a large impact on the Organism, marine organisms. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, that is quite alarming um, fact for that. For uh, acidification uh, of the ocean um, is so much for um, progressing, and then that is, of course, for directly uh, impacting or our lives, or like, uh, um, and also indirectly. Well, and then I think what we. We fear, well, um, well, there there should be also a long term um, negative impact. So that that that's something. Well, um, perhaps well later. Well, you could you could also elaborate in, um, and then we'll explain. Well, uh, how we should respond, and then um, that that's that's quite um, surprising. But um, that that's that's something happening well, um, around us. Thank you very much for your explanation. Now, um, uh, Ito Sensei. Um, are you, uh, do you hear us? Yes, now okay. I'm here. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, how the sensor now, um, talked about the, um, ocean acidification and then, uh, it was sensor. We also, uh, took the, uh, the case of, uh, fisher and fishery, um, um, impact on fishery, uh, since, well, it's, it's a very important industry for us. Well, um, uh, but the, and also it's it's a very good um, point for explanation um, to to people who 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 are not um, scientists. Um, but also, well, you uh, went further on uh, the uh, the other uh, uh, science phenomena uh, in ocean, such as like uh, less nutrients and also deoxygenation uh, on the top of um, acidification. And then, well, that that is actually well very uh, 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 well. We we learned a lot from from your explanation. Um, we we also see like uh, uh, our um, typical um, autumn fish or uh, fall fish or well, in summer uh, Pacific sorry. Well, um, we we came to learn uh, from your presentation the 
that uh, the uh, um, areas for that that stay in trouble um, around the uh, big ocean, well, then that um, has been changed. So that the well, that that's a very interesting part. Well, perhaps well, you can elaborate a little bit more on the uh, on that um, part. Well, that's that's quite attracting um, our attention. So, please. Okay, well, this is a little bit complicated figure to understand, sorry. <laughs> but uh, I to Oyashio, subtropical to subarctic region, twice for their lifespan two years. So it is a very clear migration, but uh, under the global condition, the density of the prey plankton decreases, then the growth is decreased. So that uh, uh, the migration to spanning run is delayed by the side re reduction and also the temperature between the, uh, the name is a mixed water region is enough, enough high for spanning. So they stop at there and to start spanning. Then if we compare the current Rocio to plankton density with the future mixed water region prey density. Even if future the plankton density is reduced, the density in the northern part is much higher. Then the uh, reproduction becomes better under the global change. So it is uh, out of our expectation before we done the uh, so uh, this is only, how to say, a very simple uh, simulation, but the actual uh, natural system is much more complex. So then it is very hard to make a precise pr uh, product uh, prediction for that. It's a complexity of natural um, phenomena, uh, so that the uh, still, well, um, uh, in terms of the mechanism, um, uh, not everything is uh, clear yet, uh, but uh, uh, from from your uh, research knowledge, well, uh, what what is the most influential um, uh, factors uh, among from uh, less nutrients or um, the oxygenation or um, ocean acidification? What 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 do you think is the most influential one? Or 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 in other words, well, it's not necessarily well. Um, uh, say well what what's what's the the worst thing but uh, maybe this is a matter of combination okay so the for the pacific summary uh examples they say oxygen is a no matter but for other species the combination of the oxygen decrease and acidification and the temperature is very important and many species now is a high latitude but the acidification effect is much severe in higher latitude. The combination of the temperature and the acidification to shrink uh, uh, the habitat areas. That is the issue. That uh, your your um, um, the three different maps uh, with different colors. Well, that that ex um, explains it very uh, well, even to. Um, uh, to non-scientists like us. <laughs> okay, well, Pro Professor Bindov, well, would, you, would you like to say something? I would like to say something. Um, the, the pictures that uh, Shinichi uh, just showed uh, for oxygen and temperature also feed into uh, maximum, uh, uh, maximum uh, sustainable yields for the fishing more generally. And there are some additional figures actually that follow up from those figures that Shinichiro just showed, which shows the maximum fish fisheries catch potential um, in 2100 and for a high emissions and a low emission scenario. And the scenario that was just painted by Shinichi of uh, the expanding uh, species moving towards high latitudes is precisely what is projected uh, in, in those future uh, changes. And that's slide 16 
out of the presentation I had. And, and, if, you, and if you look at those figures, it's kind of pointing to a, a percentage drop of about 50% in fish yield in the areas that uh, Japan would care about, the equatorial uh, and subtropical Pacific. Um, there's a tendency to increase yield in the Arctic and uh, high latitude Southern Ocean. So these are, this is an important kind of consequence of the warming ocean. Thank you very much for your additional point. Um, that's, that's very uh, interesting um, um, to, to speak. Um, now, uh, we have, we have a nice uh, uh, introduction of uh, and then uh, already, well, uh, Professor Dr. Bindov kicked off um, our interactive session. So um, now, um, Professor, uh, it's interesting to have questions or comments uh, from panelists to other panelists or speakers. Um, if there's any points that you want to raise, well, uh, we're happy to take um, them. Um, so I would like to open the floor um, here for your for your comments, questions or comments to other um, speakers and panelists? So um, I, there's a couple of things that we uh, could equally well cover, uh, impacts on coastal areas. And I think we can pick up on the, uh, the fact that sea level has very much emerged as a genuine issue in the equatorial band, the subtropical band, um, the figure I showed showed that uh, already those signals have emerged uh, in terms of extremes, as um, uh, uh, Mori talked about. Um, and so those two things together, added to our opening statements, uh, gives a pretty strong narrative of, of the consequences of climate change for the Pacific, for the Pacific in particular. It's, and, and maybe I, I'll ask Murray this question. So the, the, perhaps the biggest contributor to sea level rise is now the ice sheets. Do you want to talk to that perhaps? Uh, yeah, sea level rise is pretty severe uh, or a very important factor to adaptation. So as I said, adaptation uh, strategy takes uh, time leading time, depending on the how we can adapt. For example, uh, uh, for Japanese situation, you know, we started new adaptation law since last December. So now, government, central government, seriously started to consider adaptation strategy for our country. Then one, one, uh, she realized very important to cooperate to uh, change our uh, coastal defense system. And then, for example, we. Japanese uh, use a heavily concrete seawall to protect our coastal region. Then, uh, for example, in this case, installation takes 10 years. If we want to replace some coastal protection, then it will be used until end of this century. So this is the kind of situation in Japan. To implement uh, climate change impact, such kind of things, we need to Clearly consider the design of the sea dike at the end of the century as now. <laughs> then the point is how we can incorporate uh, sea level rise to realistic engineering design from now. Then IPCC, you know, for, for example, uh, SROC clearly uh, change uh, plus 10 centimeter or 20 centimeter depending on the scenario of the sea level rise at the end of century, but it only indicates uh, average with 95% uh, uh, confidence level, right? For, but however, if we want to design the sea level defense considering IPCC report, we need more detailed probability. And, uh, you know, should, and we need more detailed discussion what kind of the value should be used for the DR adaptation. For example, we if we, uh, if get uh, uh, cho cho choose the kind of uh, safety uh, side, probably ninety seven percent or sixty seven percent 
uh, exceedance probability of the sea level rise is better to uh, you know, use. But if uh, we are not uh, rely on the projection, maybe 33% of the exceedance probability of the sea level is okay. So for such kind of you know very quantitative information is important to adapt uh, uh, real situation. That is a uh, kind of my comment. Engineer is more severe. <laughs> Any response? Um, so, so sea level rise at, uh, as expressed through extremes is very regionally dependent. And, and I think the point that Murray is making is that the adaptive response is very site specific. And, and there is some evidence of that in the uh, slide I presented around extreme sea level. Um, you can see the variability of extreme sea level in the uh, projections and the time for which it, uh, the one in the 100 year return event changes. And, and so I think that point around the regional specificity, <laughs> the site uh, specific nature of the response is quite important. Yes, I agree with you. And the for adaptation, adaptation for extreme is more difficult because, as Professor uh, Bindorf said, it's very site specific, and uh, we have to consider the variability, not only the variability, also the exposure for extreme. Yeah. However, for moderate change, sea level rise, it can be occurred everywhere. So we may have a two different strategy to adapting uh, uh, coastal change, both uh, daily change, sea level rise, and extreme, like a storm surge, depending on the region, country, and exposure. Um, one additional comment. The special report um, actually makes mention of the small island developing states and low-lying areas. So while not in Japan, they are very relevant to Japanese foreign policy because they are under threat themselves. So, you know, that's uh, 65 million. Most of those small island developing states are in the western side of the Pacific. So that's something to be very mindful of. Um, some of those islands will disappear in this coming century. And the report actually says that for a first time. That's, that's a, uh, um... Well, there are um, well as as you discussed already. Well, the uh, well we need to be aware about the very long time span of um, uh, changing climate and the ocean environment. And then, uh, as uh, Mori Sensei already um, pointed out, the um, accuracy uh, or the well the, the uh, determination of uh, uh, probability or predictability. But that still we we have we're in. Um, to say uh, we were more we have more to go so i think that's that's a uh, uh, big challenge but also we we really rely on uh, uh your your great research um activities and i hope well on this uh, uh webex meeting well this is going to be open for uh, policymakers and other audiences so that they will we you probably well this this has come to be a very strong message from from your community and towered for the uh, the community will, who should support for the um, science um, activities. That's um, you for the we we talked about you talked about the something like a slow onset event, but the also extreme events for this year and last year in Japan we have suffered. We have suffered for so many and so intensive typhoons, and then. Lots of like a large scale um, um, cut, uh, number of casualty or large scale damage um, actually happened. And then uh, one of the more recent damage will be have like we had to cancel um, our Yokohama meeting so that the, some people <laughs> actually uh, traveled already to Japan. Some others will had to cancel um, flying. So that that's a uh, tropical cyclone um, Hagib Hagibis. And then, um, is that well? Sh should we say well? Um, this kind of phenomena is far more increasing uh, in the future world. 
Um, it can be, but it's a little bit difficult to say <laughs> in, uh, quantitatively. You know. Now we started to uh, estimate how much already occurred uh, global warming contributes uh, the last typhoon Hagibis. So we can say something quantitatively in the next few months. The fifth assessment report, um, uh, especially with typhoons, was um, quite uncertain. But I agree that there have been developments, uh, and Mori is referring to um, the simulations of typhoons uh, and cyclones versus the observations. And there's a, a measure or an index called fractional attributable risk, and we'll find that the, typically the risk has gone up. But the frequency of uh, typhoons is not likely to go up. So we're expecting intensification of typhoons, cyclones, uh, but not an increase in the frequency of them. And I think that is the scientific consensus currently. Yeah, I, I agree with it. I, I think about moving from, sorry, how about moving from disaster to the more <laughs> Bio yeah, I, I, um, so, so, I think there uh, we, not the chapter I was in, but uh, there is a very particular chapter that talks about uh, extremes, marine heat waves, for instance. Marine heat waves are, are recognised scientifically as new, but they've always existed, of course. Um, the Marine heat waves are doubling in uh, amplitude, are doubling in uh, uh, frequency. They're driven by climate change. The interesting thing about marine heat waves is that they're uninteresting at one level, but they're actually very interesting on their impacts on ecosystems. So there are documented cases of uh, the large scale kelps, uh, for instance, an important source of food and also for carbon some carbon sequestration, uh, they are um, frequently, depending on where they are in their range, very affected by uh, marine heat waves. The, um, we were discussed oxygen loss in the oceans. Uh, this is actually in the eastern part of the Pacific, not the western part of the Pacific, tending to define some of the habitats of uh, major fisheries. In the, report, in the current report, we talked about the fact that the ocean is getting lighter at the surface of the ocean. And so it's actually getting harder for nutrients to come up and harder for oxygen to go down into the interior of the ocean. Um, a consequence of that is the uh, reduced net primary productivity that was shown in uh, Shinichi's uh, maps. If not, it's in the maps that I showed I think it's in one of the maps I showed uh, going into the future. I, I, you know, we have relatively little time, but the thing that I think is especially important is it's not any one issue. It's actually all of the issues together, right? So uh, the Pacific is a long way from the poles, but Antarctica and Greenland are melting. Sea level's definitely going up. Sea level is driven uh, more than 50% by the melt of Antarctica and Greenland, a long way away from the Pacific, but a huge contributor to uh, sea level. And in the uh, summary for policymakers, we actually show a graph where sea level, sea level, I didn't show in my presentation, but sea level could be by 2300, five metres. Now, five metres is because of uh, uh, mass loss um, from Antarctica and Greenland. So, so there are uh, growing hazards in the sea level, food security. The Pacific has uh, got less fish in it. Um, that's a threat, 4% decline in food security. So there's, it's all of these hazards together that I think are um, a danger in, in a world where we continue to have high emissions. Thank you very much. Ito Sese, would you, would you like to um, also, you, you sent us an, actually a comment, so um, 
Perhaps so it's it's nice if we have your comments. Uh, it is regarding uh, uh, related to the adaptation issues, but the scale of the typhoon prediction is now going down because of the background humidities. So now the background humidity is increasing by a global change. Yeah. So the energy input becomes much more unstable comparing with uh, 10 years ago. So now the model is uh, improved, but the skill for prediction of the typhoon route or intensity change was becoming going down. It is a big issue for us. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And Harada-sensei, um, do for the no sushi scenario is really shocking. Um, but uh, do what what kind of countermeasures will um should we or policymakers would take to to stop or to mitigate with that negative impacts? Do you have any suggestion from your scientist perspective? Okay. Yeah. So I have an um, explain about the um their um, in-situ um, situation, for example, the warming and uh, ocean acidification impacts on the uh, marine organisms and uh, ecosystems. And also, I have um, explained about the future projection about the negative impact on the ecosystem and uh, due, due to the uh, climate change issues, but I I feel um, many people who are thinking about uh, thinking that climate change is important for their life or familiar to the action, uh, understand it is important to act something personally for environment. Even though such individual action is quite small impact, but uh, however there are lots of people. Lots of um, stakeholders who are thinking climate change issue is not high priority uh, for them. So the first, not not first priority for them. So how we help or assist to make uh, those stakeholders and the uh, policy makers be aware the importance to do action for um, environment and uh, climate change issues. So and I'm, I'm very sorry, this is not my advice, but still um, I am thinking, so how I can help or assist to make those people be aware. So if um, anybody, um, any panelists have um, very good advice or um, suggestions, I'd like to run um, the panelists' um, ideas. Yeah, the panelists, well, is if, if you have any response for, or uh, maybe what you, if you want to send out a signal or messages to, to the audience, um, um, I would appreciate you if you could have very short um, elaboration on this matter. So, very quickly, uh, if I may, uh, you know, the, what we must do is uh, adapt, and part of that adaption must be to build uh, resilience and so in the case of say fisheries it's maybe extending marine park areas uh, increasing the area of protection uh, maybe d in the fishery management uh, chase changing the uh, maximum catch that's allowed uh, these are perfectly good policy response reduce pollution um, in the natural environment, so building uh, uh, resilience. That's what people can do at the community level and at the policy level. And then on the other side, there's the emissions. And the emissions are clearly, at a global scale, the most effective way of uh, reducing the negative consequences of uh, climate change. And it's not too late, of course, because uh, we have uh, we have a hand on that lever uh, if we can uh, get there. Can I say something? Yes, please. Uh, so uh, for my uh, side, the biggest issue is the balance between adaptation and uh, mitigation. 
And the another issue is uh, uh, the, as uh, uh, Nathan mentioned, community level response to climate change. So almost all the public people are thinking they cannot anything for climate change issue. And uh, they are thinking that that is an issue for the policy makers. But for me, the general person is very important. For example, for the increasing the resilience of the ocean, uh, for example, the reducing the plastic uh, debris by uh, each person is very important activity. So we must uh, send much more simple message to general people how they should act to preserve the ocean environment. It is a very important uh, responsibility for us, I think. Thank you very much. Finally, Mori Sensei, would you like to also add your comment? That's a difficult question. I'm not familiar with public relations. At least, in my point of view, at least we have to discuss with the Bureau people more deeply. Because, uh, you know, uh, we want to input more science knowledge, especially for the adaptation to the uh, Central Bureau or uh, uh, any kind of uh, ADB or uh, JICA or other kind of uh, Australian aid or some kind of stuff because uh, generally adaptation takes a uh, uh, cost and uh, time and the mitigation also uh, expensive. So we, have, we, we cannot figure out uh, what kind of combination is best for us. At least from adaptation or impact assessment side, we have to uh, you know, say something, you know, how expensive adaptation is or what kind of adaptation we have. Then uh, maybe more big people like a Professor Bindorf can discuss, you know, what the best mix of the adaptation and uh, uh, mitigation. Thank you very much. Um, it's, a, it's a daunting uh, challenge. However, well, uh, we at the same time, we feel very much encouraged to, to have you all um, and uh, great scientists to lead us to uh, to investigate for the uh, current and the future uh, changes uh, of climate. And then um, I think what, uh, also at the same time, we'll hear uh, this um, conference itself is an initiative of uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Japan um, as the, the government uh, ministry um, uh, it, it's uh, uh, trying to um, uh, translate what this uh, great work um, from science scientists um, community to um, and also disseminating this uh, information to um, um, audiences in, in the society. I think what this is really meaningful opportunity for us uh, and I really uh, thank you uh, um, uh, taking your time uh, uh, to, to speak uh, uh, on WebEx. Uh, uh, conference here. So oh, I think the uh, time is up. Um, and then uh, with this, um, um, I would like to conclude for well, this uh, great uh, um, experience of um, having WebEx uh, meeting um, for for this, uh, uh, for, for all the uh, efforts regarding local, uh, uh, climate change and the um, Pacific Ocean. Thank you very much uh, for, for uh, your time.